All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, we are now in the closing session for our workshop on non-Western sanctions and global perspectives on sanctions that we're um, having here in uh, um, Trento, uh, in person, but also we have a few people online. And we discussed now for two days about uh, West, non-Western sanctions, and eventually global perspective on sanctions. In this last session, we are gonna have the final concluding remarks by Professor Thomas Peastaker from the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and then we're gonna have a discussion to see what it is that we are making sense of in this debate between West, non-West, and uh, possibly global IR. Without further ado, Tom, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. I'd like to begin with uh, thanks to our hosts at the University of Trento, particularly Roberto Belloni and his colleagues and staff. Uh, unfortunately, Roberto has been ill and not able to be with us in person, but he's here with us, with us online. Uh, thank you again very much, and also thanks to Francesco Gemelli from Groningen University in the Netherlands for teaming up with Roberto and uh, to organize this, this really rich uh, workshop we've been having. This recording is part of a series of recordings and live sessions uh, that have been organized by the new Global International Relations section of the International Studies Association. I'm the current co-chair of the new section along with Vinduka Kubakova, and I'm very pleased to open this concluding session of the workshop. Let me begin first with just a few comments on what I think of when I think of global IR. And for me, it's a way of thinking that stresses a self-conscious reflection in the world, uh, on the world, but a self-conscious reflection from different vantage points. And it proceeds uh, from an assumption that the non-judgmental interplay of differences in perspectives constitutes the creative potential of our subject, and that it is important to create spaces like the one we've had the last couple of days for conversations that are resonant with non-alienating or at least comprehensible to the lived experiences of individuals from different parts of the world. And I say that because we're all parochial in different ways, and I believe we need deliberately and self-consciously to reflect on the different parochialisms, be they geographical, generational, gendered, racial, ontological, or epistemological, and make a, a conscious effort to transcend these parochialisms. Global IR obviously requires global participation and representation, and again, this workshop has illustrated that with the variety of perspectives and, and, and vantage points and representation of, of participants in the workshop. But just having someone from every continent isn't sufficient. We need to actively embrace the idea of difference, and we need to listen. We need to listen carefully to the views of others. We also need to promote a recognition of knowledge that knowledge produced everywhere, including outside of the West, as critical contributions in order to understand our complex world. And finally, let me add that while we may find ourselves at times in uncomfortable positions, uh, the potential insights of global multi-perspectivism are many, and I believe the creation of this new section uh, was not only timely, but also will ultimately deepen our collective understanding and strengthen the International Studies Association. So with that as a context and framing for this, as I say, this is one in a, a series of, of five different uh, video recordings that have been made by the new section over the course of, uh, of our first year of existence. Uh, but let me now shift to direct comments and some concluding reflections just to get the, the, the conversation started with, with the rest of you. Um, and so I've been listening, I didn't give a presentation. Uh, this is my first presentation at the conference. I've been listening, um, hopefully understanding and, and uh, getting your many very interesting presentations uh, correctly. Um, and I want to just offer some, to get, get us started, some of my own personal reflections on the conversations over the last two days. And I want to begin, as I, I did in, in many of the commentaries I made on the different papers, with a problematization of the West versus non-West as the orienting framework. Um, and that's not to dismiss it. There are many utilities, we've been talking about this, but <clears throat> I think Machiko brought us to this idea in her opening presentation <clears throat> on dichotomies in the, first, in the very first session of the conference. And she made the, I think, very important argument that these dichotomies, West, non-West, reify the West, implicitly setting the West as benchmark 
as constituting and disadvantaging the other, the non-West. And I think we need to, if we're going to use the phrase, then we need to think, what do we mean by the West? What is the West? Are the sanctions on Russia only from the West? Oftentimes we see that in public discourse about the sanctions on Russia. But what's the meaning of the West and non-West? And when, one, when, when the network of sanctioning countries includes Japan, South Korea, and Singapore. So moving beyond the West and non-West toward a global conversation might be a more productive way of thinking about this. And, and many of the participants of this workshop, um, I would argue at least appear to live on borderlands, not clearly in West or non-West. Um, but I, it, as I said at the last session, I think we should think about this distinction not in binary terms, but as a continuum. Uh, and that might be a different way of, of framing the discussions about multiple perspectives on international sanctions. I want to pick up on another point that came out in the first uh, first morning session, uh, and that's the idea that the realm of unilateral sanctions is less well regulated and reliant on informal norms than the application of United Nations sanctions. Uh, there's an absence of fixed rules in the domain of unilateral sanctions. Um, and this was a point that, uh, and, and no clear baselines, this was a point made by our Chinese colleague uh, Dao Jiang in, in his presentation. Yet, I would argue that we don't see, we see some activity, but not the level of activity that we saw in the United Nations in the past. So that we might actually be seeing uh, this new informal multilateral governance with coordinated sanctions, unilateral sanctions from multiple sources, that might be the type of sanctions we're more likely to see in the future. So this is unregulated, uh, relies on informal norms, and, and there are no fixed rules or baselines to operate with in this domain which is both a research challenge, but I think also a normative and, and, and ultimately political challenge as well. So we have multiple sources. The impacts, as someone said in a recent session, of the sanctions are global, but the decision making appears to be centered in Brussels and Washington. That's the point that, that uh, Roberto made in his presentation on Serbia earlier today. Another, beyond the focus on the realm of unilateral sanctions, another takeaway for me at least is, and maybe this is too harsh a word, it's not, not clinically applied, but a certain kind of schizophrenia amongst um, and within the BRICS, uh, with, uh, and actually many countries of the global south, it's not just within the BRICS. Um, and this is because they all employ sanctions themselves, but they don't call them sanctions. They're instruments of foreign policy, they're defenses of national security, uh, they're the use of economic constraints to protect our national interests. Um, it sounds a bit hypocritical here, and this is a point that both Rashika and, and, and Alvin made in their, their presentations yesterday, but of course there's also hypocrisy in the so-called West acting on behalf of the preservation of international order or its conception of international society, a point that Matteo made uh, earlier today. But are the same tools used by, by both West and non-West? Uh, there's an active intervention into the affairs of others by the BRICS countries, a point, again, that Rishika made. Um, and Irena mentioned this morning that the practices remain the same, but the narratives differ. And that's a point I want to come back to at, at the very conclusion. So just what are sanctions? A point that Francesco made uh, yesterday. Is there a difference here in terminology? Is it nomenclature? What are we talking about? Do we actually have a common understanding of what sanctions are. And I'm not sure we may need to revisit that as well. This then takes us to the question of when is it legitimate to apply sanctions autonomously? Uh, again, Francesco, when you, just at the end of the last session, when you said, when is it normal to apply restrictive measures? Um, it seems to be OK, as Andre mentioned yesterday, to sanction non-state armed groups. but. It's more complicated when you're sanctioning states. Uh, and there, this may be that, that my, my, why we see the consensus, particularly in counterterrorism sanctions measures, as opposed to uh, sanctions applied to, to states or their publics. Again, um, a point I made yesterday in response to Andre's point about the change in nomenclature at the UN itself, replacing the names of countries under sanctions by using UN Security Council resolution numbers, like 1988, rather than Afghanistan Taliban, or um, changing the name of the, of the regime itself from Somalia to Al-Shabaab, uh, for example. So uh, is the 
here's the question. Is the issue of the nature of the tool, is, is that the issue, sanctions, or is it, and their inherent legitimacy, or is it the purposes to which they have been put? Again, we're back, and this is something I'll say in a moment about contestation over, over global norms. I think it's an issue of whether or not we're talking about the inherent illegitimacy or legitimacy of sanctions, or is it the purposes for which these restrictive measures are being applied? Um, that anticipates a point I want to make about um, global conversations about sanctions are oftentimes illustrations of, of a global contestation over fundamental norms. Uh, is the use of force justified? What's the status of territorial integrity? Uh, what's the meaning of non-interference, sovereignty? To what extent are we seeing anti or post-colonial arguments being presented? What's, this, what's the viability of, of, of sovereignty? Where are human rights in all of this? We're, we're, I think we need to come back to the status of, of core norms of international society and recognize that there's not an obvious consensus. And this is, again, a point that Francesco made. It's, it's normal, it's not normal for everyone to agree on everything. So we need to live again with this kind of difference and this kind of uncertainty uh, at, at different points. Um, so what is the status of core norms of international society like the illegitimacy of the use of force, proportionality in the use of force, the prohibition against international state aggression, the territorial integrity of states recognized by others, and again, does everyone have to agree on this? Uh, but these are where the debates, I think, exist. And it's fundamentally, uh, sanctions involve these kinds of normative questions, uh, fundamentally in some ways. Um, another very interesting discussion uh, came up again at the, I think from uh, Zhao Jiang's uh, uh, point in the first day. Are the like-minded states of, less, of liberal Western uh, societies applying sanctions increasingly? Is this being challenged by an emergent alternative group of like-minded states, privileging sovereignist norms of non-intervention bent on delegitimizing the use of sanctions as an instrument to support liberal norms. And I think we can view this maybe not in such binary terms. It's more complicated than that. But I'm hearing that from a number of the presentations. Another point, one of my takeaways, is that we often entered into geopolitics, again, even this morning's discussion about Serbia in particular, but, but also about uh, the ASEAN group. Um, and, and about Brazil and Mexico. I mean, we, we've been having these conversations about what's motivating different countries. Um, but there's evidence, I think, of perhaps a new non-alignment movement coming about the sanctions issue of, of the sanctions on Russia over Ukraine is creating a, a return to a Cold War idea that we associated with the so-called third world, three worlds of development, but in fact a non-aligned movement as well, which is closely associated with that. So it appears that we're seeing um, a, a forms of a new non-aligned movement forming at the global level, prompted by reactions to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and increased calls for countries to take sides. And we see that within the UN General Assembly votes. And the very interesting paper uh, that, again, Matteo presented this morning about Southeast Asian countries uh, changes over time with regard to votes in the General Assembly on different issues. Another takeaway for me is that there's been a significant discussion of the post-colonial experience, the legacies of, co of colonialism that generates ambiguity about the liberal international order, given its, its association historically with the West, and the general discourse that describes the sanctions regime as Western, even if it isn't. Um, we also talked uh, this morning again about, uh, well, both, both Christina yesterday and Roberto this morning talked about perceptions of double standards being, being at play here. Sanctions that inhibit, and, and as Rashika just said at the end of the last session, sanctions that inhibit my development reinforce your superiority. Sanctions disturb me. That, that's a very important theme and element to bring out in terms of what's explaining the reaction in different parts of the world to the sanctions. Yesterday, we also had a very interesting presentation from John Agbonifo from, from Nigeria talking about the African pragmatism, the communitarian approach, as he described it, uh, the peer review, uh, as Andre described it in, 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 uh, in his paper also on, on interventions of, of uh, ECOWAS. Um, the idea that um, the African Union, this is uh, Andre's point, suspends, uh, and then ECOWAS is oftentimes the first mover when it comes to applying comprehensive sanctions. 
but often focuses on individual leaders when it's, when it's trying to apply and moves with, with quite a great deal of, of deafness and flexibility compared to other sanctioning parties. Uh, I, tr I frequently mention this when I'm talking about sanctions. It's not just something that the US, the EU, and the UN do. It's actually something that many African states do collectively uh, together uh, on these issues. Um, so it's, it's an important uh, way to describe the policies of different parts of the world. But is it possible then to scale up this more communitarian sanctions approach where we're applying sanctions on members of our community rather than members outside our community? Uh, this seems to be an African initiative, first with the AU on, on non-constitutional changes of regimes, but ECOWAS within the region. Uh, but does this extend to other organizations? The OAS, yes, uh, but not the EU. The EU sanctions are exclusively out of area, out, not on EU members, but outside the European Union itself. And also, as we heard this morning, not, not ASEAN, uh, given its opposition to the use of sanctions uh, more generally. So here are points that both uh, Andre and Matteo made about uh, other, look, reminding us about other regional organizations and their tendency or not to, to apply sanctions. Just a couple of final points. Um, we heard a lot about the fear of being sanctioned as a reason not to apply sanctions. Uh, this is the reference uh, from Christina about Mexico, Andre about Brazil, and Mateo about ASEAN. Um, and it's interesting that the basis of this fear seems to be that to impose unilateral sanctions measures would legitimize their use by others, uh, particularly by great powers. And this reluctance to engage in this practice, in fact, fearing that it might then come back to, to haunt them, or maybe it's the self-interest, we can talk about that as well. But uh, again, Andre mentioned the fear of being sanctioned, Brazil particularly about eco, eco sanctions, uh, ecological sanctions. Um, but then a point made more on national interests, uh, again quoting from this morning's discussion, we have nothing more to add to the US and EU sanctions. What's gained uh, by having Mexico or Brazil, um, or Indonesia for that matter, apply sanctions? Uh, when given the potential risks uh, for middle powers. So this is a, perhaps a rational calculation, not just a, mm -hmm. a, an ideational one. Um, one final point raised in, in Christina's paper that, that I was really struck by is the independent role of private actors in the sanctions world. We didn't spend as much time on this, but it was one of the points where you said that even if the Mexican government is not taking the lead on sanctions, Mexican financial institutions are complying with the restrictive measures, again, out of self-interest, out of concerns about secondary sanctions. Uh, but it's, it's also relevant to the discussion about Russia because um, there's been, there have been over a thousand firms that have voluntarily divested uh, from Russia, what I sometimes refer to as voluntary or civil society sanctions. Uh, which means that the sanctions designed by states are actually broadened in implementation by private sector actors based on their own self-interest, but also on their own sometimes normative views, depending on, 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 on what you read from the private sector on these issues. So we have examples of private sector firms making autonomous decisions independently of the official sanctions policies of their states. We found this in Mexico, Brazil, India as well, but also in Europe uh, over the JCPOA after the U.S. abandoned it. So it's not a practice that's unique to, uh, to other parts of the world. Finally, um, contemporary issues. Uh, why has Russia's invasion of Ukraine not prompted uh, more of an anti-colonial or anti-imperial concern amongst formerly colonized countries? I mean, sanctions are on Russia, at least as I interpret them, are a response to a violation of, of core international norms about the use of force, interstate aggression, the principle of non-intervention. But we see symbolic voting and statements in the General Assembly, but no material action against Russia. The, the point that, again, Matteo made this morning about this is not my war, that kind of an attitude. Uh, where countries are distancing themselves from the use of sanctions, even though at times they will use them in the pursuit of national interest. But this is an interesting uh, anomaly, which I think uh, we, we can explore further. Uh, and then a final point about strategies of uh, resistance and counter-hegemonic measures. Um, declarations uh, of support for the principle of non-intervention may be a weapon of the weak, but it's, it's, it's limited or there's no identification with Ukraine. And, and that's an interesting absence of identification of imagining, well, if this can happen to Ukraine, couldn't it happen in my region? And that's, that's part of an argument we haven't really heard much about. 
Again, the Russian narrative is a really interesting, fascinating presentation by Itagam this morning um, when he said, the world is larger than the West, uh, that being the Russian part, of, the key part of the Russian narrative. And this is part of this hegemonic measure where we see a realignment away from the West amongst other sanctioned countries. It's a new form of international cooperation. If you're heavily sanctioned, uh, you have a lot in common. You have a lot to cooperate about, and we're seeing a lot of cooperation, both in arms, uh, in, in resources, uh, in, in, in the export of oil and other things. So we have um, a realignment away from the West to other sanctioned countries, China, potentially Iran, certainly, as we heard from, from Fariba, uh, Myanmar, uh, countries that have been sanctioned before seem particularly prone to joining this discourse, something that Roberto made a point that Roberto made about, about Serbia. Uh, but also a Fariba made in her discussion about Iran's coping strategies. So those are just a few ideas. I've been listening, trying to pull some themes together and listening to the very interesting presentations over the last couple of days. I just uh, want to say one thing before I turn this back to Francesco about um, we haven't talked much about methods of analysis. <clears throat> we've, we've been, uh, and in fact, oftentimes the sanctions discourse is, is crowded with discussions about appropriate methods or inappropriate methods for analysis. Most of these have been fascinating case studies, descriptions, uh, some relying on survey data, as, as Itagam's paper did this morning, um, others really just interpretations of national policy, and that's nothing wrong with that. But I think one potential strand we might want to think about methodologically going forward is the idea of, of constructing and then comparing uh, or exploring comparative narratives about sanctions in different parts of the world. Um, how sanctions relate to identity and, and who we are. If you, I guess it was a little over a year ago, I was uh, on, on a webinar talking about U EU sanctions on Belarus uh, and over the downing of the, not downing of the plane, but the, you know, it was the forced landing of the plane and then extracting uh, Belarusian uh, opponent of the regime from, from the flight and basically in, incarcerating him. Uh, and I said that the EU had no choice but to apply sanctions because not to apply them. It's part of Europe, Europe's identity that, that you couldn't not act in this particular situation. So this is where the, the sanctions often relate to identity. And uh, again, as, as a point that Irena made this morning, the practices remain the same, but the narratives differ. So we might think about uh, sanctions as a performative act and articulation of norms because I would argue, at least when I look at United Nations sanctions, which is mainly what I focus on in my own research, uh, every single Security Council resolution is, is, ma is making normative signals. That, that's a key part. Every single, they may not all attempt to constrain, they may not all attempt to, to coerce a change in behavior, but they all attempt to send normative signals. And I think that's a theme across all these issues. Uh, I could go on. Uh, I'm interested in, in people's reflections beyond these, and, and particularly, um, where are the research blind spots? What are we missing? That might be another way of, of stimulating the, the question. But thanks uh, very much for the forum, and now I'm looking forward to hearing from my, my colleagues uh, on this very issue. Tom, thank you very much. I don't think um, I can thank you enough for may, you know, summarizing 11 presentations uh, that we had in five different panels going from uh, sanctions in the international system to the African perspective, emerging powers. Today we talked about the elephant in the room, of course, sanctions and Russia. So uh, this is very fascinating. Thank you very much. I would then now ask uh, my co-host uh, for this event, uh, Roberto. Uh, Belloni from the University of Trento, maybe to uh, open up the discussion in what are the takeaways uh, from this uh, workshop, uh, these two days. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Um, the first point I want to make is that um, I am really sorry I've been unable to be in Trento with you. The discussion has been very uh, challenging and compelling and very rich. And um, because of health reasons, uh, I, I couldn't travel to Trento and uh, participate in person, but um, it's been a very interesting uh, two one and a half day for me. And um, um, also um, a very le steep learning uh, curve because uh, the sanction theme is uh, something relatively new for me. And so it's been very interesting uh, to learn uh, more. <clears throat> I, uh, before I share very briefly, because I also don't have very much voice, uh, 
I share a couple of takeaway points from my part. Um, I, um, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming uh, to Trento and those who are connected online and for participating and for sharing your research and thoughts and being so actively involved in the discussion. And uh, Francesco Giumelli really played a very key role uh, in uh, making this happen um, uh, today and yesterday. And, uh, and uh, everyone else uh, at the Department uh, of Sociology and Social Research at the University of Trento actually funded this meeting. So my thanks are certainly extended to the Department uh, for their support. And um, I uh, very briefly, I. Um, I think that one uh, um, way of assessing the one standard, perhaps, to, to assess the success of a meeting is the number of questions raised, and not so much the number of answers provided. And uh, um, I think if we apply that standard, this is certainly a very interesting meeting because a number of very interesting issues have been. Uh, uh, discuss at length and, uh, and the complexity of the theme has come through very clearly. Um, as of me, um, and Tom has provided a very compelling uh, overview uh, discussion of the themes that have been raised of this, over the last uh, two days. Um, as of me, I think that perhaps I want to share a couple of things that um, I found particularly Interesting from my perspective uh, as a non sanctioned scholar, I should say. Um, and um, the first one uh, is the importance of the post colonial condition. I think I have underestimated, personally, I have underestimated how important uh, is the post colonial condition uh, to assess the, the post colonial condition, in other words, uh, is uh, the, the lenses uh, through which states assess uh, the international liberal order. And um, and uh, it, it is uh, through these lenses that many states tend to privilege a pluralist order and the norms of non-intervention and non-interference. And, uh, and then because of this reason, my understanding is that many states in the Global South see sanctions as a sort of a unwanted interference in domestic affairs. And I have not, uh, before this meeting, uh, I, I, I did not fully realize the importance of this point. The second point, which I found very interesting is, uh, which perhaps follows from this, uh, is the, uh, an underlying distrust in the international order. Um, uh, many states uh, feel, um, at the margin of the international order, and as mentioned, as Tom mentioned earlier, uh, there is a sense in which uh, uh, double standards are applied, uh, right or wrong. That is the perception that many states have. And uh, but also, I would add to that point is that uh, the the idea that sanctions are a very blunt instrument that uh, creates a situation in which um, a, a condition of us versus them, either you join the sanctions regime and you are with us or you are against us. So there is a normative statement that Tom was saying that is uh, pushes the states in the corner and pushes them to choose. But many states, I have explored the case of Serbia, but it's not the only one. Many states will find it uh, uh, difficult to make a final choice. There are a number of considerations of whether there are normative considerations, uh, economic considerations, uh, and geopolitical considerations to decide whether or not to join the sanctions regime and to apply sanctions regime. And the final and last point, uh, um, perhaps before entering this uh, very interesting discussion, uh, I thought I would have found, uh, um, I would have met uh, more arguments, uh, more identity, more cultural arguments. So certainly there are some cultural arguments that have been raised, but uh, another takeaway point for me is uh, the importance of self-interest in foreign policy, also for states in the Global South. This is perhaps obvious for those of you who study <laughs> the Global South. Um, uh, but um, um, 
but this is an important point to, to go back to the starting comment by Tom. So what is the difference between West and non-West? Sanctions are, seem to be, at least to a large extent, a tool used by states in the global South to protect their national interest, which is not different from the way sanctions are applied in the West. And in that sense, uh, we come full circle. West and non-West is a dichotomy that uh, is the starting point that we should problematize in order to explore even further these issues of sanctions. So thank you for your attention and thank you again for being part of this uh, discussion. Thank you, Roberto. Again, very interesting. Now I would open the floor. Uh, for anyone who wants to uh, contribute and start uh, the discussion, I would only ask you, if you can, to introduce yourself, also for the audience uh, that, I will, that will be watching this recording later. Who would like to start? Matteo, please. Andre? Um, thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you for inviting me to this workshop. I'm Matteo Dian. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the University of Bologna in Italy. Um, my main comments uh, are partially similar to what has been raised already, but I would underline again, uh, this workshop has done a very good job in underlining the necessity to include a pluralist and plural perspectives on the issue of sanctions and more broadly in um, approaching the issue of global IR as something that needs to be uh, generally plural in a number of ways. And therefore, many of the considerations that we've been doing during this uh, workshop sort of stem from this perspective. Um, I think particularly important is the, the, the point on seeing sanctions not in isolation, but within a broader process of contestation of the international order. So different perspectives emerge also because um, different actors are rising, are increasingly relevant in international order. So those perspectives become even more influential and more important. And also we see in this way that a difference that perhaps was already there before is much more visible today. And we made a few examples going from um, uh, African states to Brazil, to, to Southeast Asia, uh, to India. Possibly those, those different perspectives were already there, but now we are a bit more confronted uh, with them and we need to understand them even better than before. Um, so going back to the point of sanctions, I mean, sanctions <laughs> sometimes are policy instruments, but as we underlined, uh, are also signals. Costly signals because we forgive economic opportunities, but sometimes uh, are ways to show our alignment with those who pro uh, promote the policy that um, the seeks to impose costs in, in this case of uh, on Russia, but it can be on other on other countries. But it is a way to take a position, uh, not just on 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 a particular conflict or on a particular situation, but on the underlying norms uh, prevailing in international order. Uh, I think the other important point that it has emerged is about post-colonial narratives. Uh, we saw how in different places, um, in different regions, the post-colonial legacy is very significant. It contributes to shape a certain understanding of um, the necessity to maintain core norms like respect of sovereignty and non-interference. But we also saw that that can lead to different interpretations. Because if we see, for instance, Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a violation of territorial integrity, therefore certain states would uh, react and condemn Russia and saying, this is clearly a violation of territorial integrity and therefore should be condemned as such. <clears throat> but very often, possibly in the majority of cases, that led to a different reaction. So the post-colonial narrative has been declined in another way, which is non-alignment. And again, this strong feeling, widespread, um, in so-called non-Western world, if we want to use that dichotomy, um, has been, this is not my conflict, but especially this is not my international order to defend. And this shows that from 
the standpoint of analyzing sanctions, we have a particularly interesting observation point uh, on the international order. So seeing how many states are not interested or not normatively tied up with a certain idea of the international order that is associated implicitly or explicitly with hierarchies. So that is another important point, seeing how the West has been seen as uh, hegemonic, uh, but very often as uh, hypocritical. So the West that stands up for Ukraine didn't stand up for uh, other countries that were suffering for aggression or uh, any, any other kind of hardship. So I think it's particularly important, and I think, um, to understand these positions, to um, do better uh, IR theory, but also to have a more accurate um, perspective on certain policies when we do policy analysis. So I think that the workshop has done an excellent job in, in those terms. And thank you again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Matteo. I have the second in the list, Maria Cristina. Thank you. I would like to thank Roberto and Francesco for the invitation to, to be at this at these sessions, uh, they have been very challenging, very very interesting. I'm Cristina Rosas from Mexico. I'm a professor at the National University of Mexico, based in Mexico City. And uh, during my participation, I have tried to address the position of my country when it comes to sanctions. Sanctions uh, in Mexico have not been uh, has not been a topic that is of interest to the academics or uh, the diplomatic world. Uh, I mentioned that we have uh, only a few works written by Mexicans on the issue. And this can be explained by the fact that uh, sanctions are seen as an interventionist measure of uh, powerful countries. When you ask uh, Mexican diplomats or even political appointees that hold diplomatic positions, they would tell you that uh, Mexico should privilege diplomacy over sanctions. Uh, I think that's common in Latin America, but in the case of Mexico, Mexico would always privilege diplomacy and even constructive engagement. We didn't talk a lot about constructive engagement. That would be also a, a point to, to explore in the future, I think. But then, despite uh, that Mexico lacks or seem to lack, uh, seems to lack interest uh, on the issue, uh, a group of Mexican diplomats have drafted uh, legislation on applying sanctions by the UN. Mexico does not l have a legislation as opposed to the UN, uh, US and other nations that uh, have legislations to apply multilateral UN sanctions. Now, if you ask Mexico about sanctions, Mexico knows that uh, we need to apply sanctions. But if you ask Mexico what uh, sanctions suits the country, Mexico would go for multilateral sanctions, of course, because they are perceived as more legitimate as opposed to unilateral sanctions. And uh, despite that, um, well, Mexico has been dealing with uh, both. <laughs> And uh, Mexico has had a very inconsistent behavior when it comes to sanctions. For instance, it, it, it sanctioned North Korea between 2015 and 2017 due to its nuclear uh, program, uh, but uh, it decided it would not sanction Russia. And, uh, the reason for not sanctioning Russia has to do with the fact that uh, sanctions against Russia are not multilateral. So. Um, the president was very clear, Lopez Obrador president was very clear, that he wants peace between Ukraine and, and Russia. He even proposed a peace plan <laughs> that was dismissed by Ukraine uh, uh, for the two countries. But uh, yes, uh, he was very clear, we are not going to apply sanctions to Russia, even though our relationship with Russia commercially, trade, uh, I don't know, is not that relevant. That said, Mexico has been exposed to sanctions, mostly unilateral sanctions by the US due to trade concerns, immigration concerns, drug trafficking concerns, and uh, probably one of the most prominent uh, unilateral uh, uh, sanctions that uh, has uh, pushed Mexico to 
to have a, a, a very clear position on the issue is the Helms Burton Act that was enacted by the US government. The Helms Burton Act has a number of provisions, including secondary and tertiary sanctions. And uh, well, the government, the Mexican government, has been very critical of these sanctions and uh, has clearly uh, condemned sanctions. But uh, what it is interesting, and I think Tom was uh, referring to that a few moments ago, is that private actors, that is Mexican companies that uh, are, you know, uh, having businesses all over the world, including the United States, have decided to, to uh, comply with sanctions. So we have the, a number of, of Mexican companies, companies such as Cemex, the cement giant that quit Cuba for that reason. And speaking about Russia, uh, and that is another subject that probably uh, should be analyzed in more detail, as Tom suggested, is the role of private companies in complying with sanctions, even though uh, the states to which they belong are not sanctioning countries. Uh, Bimbo, which is uh, another food uh, giant in Mexico that has operations all over the world, quit the Ukraine and Russia for fear of being sanctioned in the States or Spain or other countries. So uh, we've seen a consistent behavior by Mexican companies uh, in terms of complying with, with, with sanctions, even though the Mexican government condemns sanctions uh, and criticizes them. Finally, uh, as uh, for the future, uh, I think, uh, well, yes, the role of private actors in sanctions is uh, a subject we should be looking at. Uh, also, the role of elected Security Council members uh, in sanctions enacting and debates. Mexico is currently, it's about to finish now, uh, Brazil is, is currently a member of the uh, UN Security Council. Mexico has been there uh, in 2021 and is finishing now. And, uh, well, the Security Council is, you know, the main authority in dealing with sanctions, so it would be interesting to see, because some of the people here uh, belong to countries that have been elected members to the UN Security Council, to see uh, whether this uh, forces them to develop a, a policy, a more consistent policy regarding sanctions. Um, also, another topic uh, is the threat of sanctions. We discussed this a bit uh, because in many cases it was not, not necessary to, to enact sanctions as such, but to threat countries with sanctions. I, I have written on, on the issue. I, I have looked at examples in Brazil where the threat of sanctions led Brazil to change its IT policies or in the case of Mexico, the threat of uh, economic trade sanctions led uh, the Mexican government to become a third safe country for uh, Central American migrants. So uh, the threat of sanctions is an issue that we should be looking at. And uh, also the relevance, as I mentioned, the relevance of constructive engagement as an alternative to sanctions. Thank you. Cristina, thank you very much again. And now I'll pass, uh, give the floor to Irene. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you for the organizer of this uh, workshop that has been uh, extremely interesting. Um, I want to focus just on one point. Um, I came here with, uh, uh, how can I say, with a very modest knowledge on sanctions, I would say modest to poor knowledge on sanctions, especially compared to other people in this meeting, uh, both physically and online. So my idea of sanctions was actually of uh, them being tools or instruments to influence or constrain other states' policy choices. So in my view, it was also a discussion that was very much linked to the technicalities of sanctions. Um, and of course, uh, I stress again my little knowledge on this, but actually um, against this, I go home with a completely different perspective on sanctions. And I think this is the main takeaway of this workshop. Yep. 
um, in twisting the perspective on sanctions, I think the global IR lens um, was actually fundamental. Um, and I go home with this idea of sanctions as actually something that can create a community, that can create political agency, or to say it even better, perhaps, that can create some that can create a geography of identities, no? Mm -hmm. So we talked about the like-minded who, who do sanction in the same way. We talked about those who do not sanction, Matteo presentation. We talked about those who reject sanctions or even those who say, perhaps, uh, mm -hmm. they do sanction differently with the presentation by John yesterday. Um, so I think this is um, uh, this is really uh, what my take main takeaway is from this workshop, which really I think increases the uh, you know also the, the the research lines that I'm following in my personal research. And I wanna uh, the last very last point is that methodologically for in. Um, mm, uh, I think an interesting question is actually not to look at differences, but actually to look at um, similarities uh, across this um, um, understanding of sanctions and how they are incorporated into um, actors agency. And I leave it here. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much. That was Irene Constantini from the University of Naples. <laughs> uh, and now I'll, uh, I'll uh, give the floor to André. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me. My name is André Alzazes. I am a PhD candidate at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. I think I will start by just reacting a little bit on Professor B. Stecker talk about borderlands and how I am, I am a, I'm possibly an example of that in terms of being a Brazilian, um, being trained as a PhD student and candidate in a Swiss university, but then studying both United Nations but also African sanction. And then you see about like a little bit this global IR discussion here because is a West or non-West perspective is difficult to say because in terms of academic training, it wasn't a Swiss university in terms of upbringing. Uh, I'm Brazilian, but in terms of object of study, I'm studying African sanctions. So it's a bit difficult to classify in a way uh, what exactly, uh, what, what I stand in this sense. Um, in terms of the, what we have been discussed for the past two days, I think my first point is just to say that the academic peer review is actually Hellquist and I just and it, it's unfortunate she's not with us yes, today. Yeah. Um, and I think one interesting thing of a Hellquist uh, met, met, metaphor about sanctions as academic peer review when she look at regional organizations. And maybe we can think about not only regional organizations, we can think about unilateral, mm -hmm. is the notion of equality. Is the notion that maybe sanctions are legitimate when is someone who we consider uh, or equal or someone in the same standard of development, of power, but when it becomes um, thing, uh, actions from different stages of development, stage of different power, then it's not that legitimate. I think that's the first uh, consideration. I think the second consideration is more general. I think I'm very happy that we, I mean, the discussion has really fleshed out sanctions as a costly signal, sanction as a statement on normative on norms, but also probably, as uh, Irene just says, on identity. I mean, who you align with, who you belong with, right? And then I think just go beyond what's often we have, often people discuss about sanction works or not, or sanctions as a pain, uh, pain, pain instrument. You're talking about like sanctions as a performative act. Because when you ask a country like Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia, or why do you not sanction Russia? You're not asking about how much pain Indonesia can inflict on Russia. You're asking about sanction as a signal that signals a Indonesia agreement or disagreement with Russian perspective. 
right? And then how much the intensity? It's enough to vote against Russia in the General Assembly, or it's, it needs more, it needs a costly signal as a sanction, as a more um, important signal of the agreement or disagreement. I think we have come also to some discussion about the legitimacy of the sanction being linked to national interest. But here is an interesting discussion because somehow, I mean, we, at least from my perspective, I heard that from Professor um, in the first presentation during the Chinese case and then later in the Indian case, and also in discussion with the BRICS, this, this kind of interesting that narratively, you are against unilateral sanction. In practice, you are not. And when you, but when you deep down and, and dive in and screw and try to drill down what does it mean in, in theory, it looks like it's almost something like unilateral sanctions are legitimate when it protects your national interest. And you say, okay, but what type of national interest? And it looks like it's national interest as your territory or your population, and the population is a bit tricky because it looks like a more expensive notion of population than we normally have. It's like people of same ethnicity, same like cultural values, but that is this notion. And then the notion that when <coughs> sanctions are imposed because of democracy or human rights in general, then they're not legitimate. So that it, it seems to have this kind of discussion that this, this unilateral actions and anti sanctions when for this more narrow understanding of national interest is actually legitimate and not really uh, if it's not. And I think um, in terms of, um, just, just get my, my notes, uh, I think there is uh, two last points. I think one interesting that we discussed maybe should explore a bit better is the notion of risk. We discussed two notions of risk here. I think you, we discussed the notion of the risk of you sanction Russia or any other actor and then being and suffer the and then being sanctioned later using the same argument or legitimate the action. But also in reverse, we said certain case like Switzerland maybe, and maybe even Singapore, who is the risk of not sanctioning might be actually greater, you know, in terms of you have to join the, the crowd because otherwise you risk yourself to have a lot of pain. So it, it's interesting, that it's, it's both a risk in the both cases, but very different like uh, consequences. And in terms of method, that's my last point, uh, I would be interested to see more on domestic politics when you look at sanctions, how different groups uh, basically fight about like uh, the sanctions to be imposed uh, or trying to influence the sanctions. Because sanctions are somehow also if they are actually implemented distributive actions, right? So some gain, some lose. So to see this kind of, uh, to understand this kind of game in terms of, of these countries actually discussing if I apply sanctions to this country, how much is gain, how much you lose, not just materially, but also immaterially in terms of uh, narrative in terms of how I mobilize my population to get votes, you know. So there is more, not just material, uh, but also in terms of legitimacy. And I think that's it for now, but thanks for being here. Andre, thank you very much again for this very nice and comprehensive uh, um, uh, set of thoughts on this. I see now uh, from the crowd online, uh, Mashiko. Thank you, um, Matiko Konataki from Utrecht University. Um, so yeah, just wish it to share a few thoughts based on the, the last two days. And I have learned really a lot from different presentations. Um, but I think one of the sort of key points, uh, at least for me to take away, uh, to, to, uh, to absorb further is a bit of a reminder that how past uh, how practice and ideologies and, and uh, narrative of the past are in, embedded in the present measures and, and, and narratives about those measures. So the fact that um, uh, there is a sort of category of, of West and non-West and the fact that there is the theme of the conference in itself is already uh, a huge legacy of the past. 
So, I mean, we are discussing many things on the basis of so many baggage that we have to carry in a sense. So that was a bit of one sort of set of reminder that I that I wanted to uh, sort of keep for myself. And this affects quite a few things. Uh, for instance, uh, Thomas discussed the notion of legitimacy. But when we start talking about uh, on what standard, uh, you know, we assess the legitimacy of sanctions, and those standards are necessarily intertwined with, with the notion of security, notion of human rights uh, that are embedded in the past practices. So I think we need to be aware of that. Obviously, that's very difficult, um, but just need to uh, be conscious of the interactions between the past and present. And um, so this is also very much related to international legal regulation of, um, on sanctions, uh, as we have already discussed briefly at the beginning. So the fact that there is a relatively less developed regulation for unilateral sanctions really reflect on the huge assumption that economic um, forms of coercion have been understood as less destructive. But I think it's good to question that assumption and try to build better regulation for the future. And finally, yeah, as Andre mentioned, uh, I fully agree with the importance of giving attention to domestic complexities, both as a ground for building the forms of sanctions and also as, as, as an angle with which to understand why sanctions have worked or haven't worked. So in the field of sanctions uh, at the UN level and uh, unilateral level, uh, including primary and secondary sanctions, the US domestic law has uh, a predominant presence or influence in the shaping of the measures. So that we tend to ask, underestimate from time to time when those measures are taken at the international level. And uh, yeah, in order to understand what is the impact of sanctions? I mean, we tend to somehow underestimate domestic complexities as this, those are sort of the subsidiary issues. But I fully agree with Andre in the sense that we really need to pay attention to domestic complexity in terms of understanding origins as well as the way, uh, sort of the, the way forward. Thanks. Mashiko, thank you very much. And then we stay now online with John. Um. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I must uh, appreciate uh, Tom and the Roboto and all other contributors. I think they have uh, succinctly uh, brought out the major uh, points or issues in the conversations we've had uh, since yesterday. I just only wanted to, um, to emphasize that uh, unilateral sanctions uh, is almost alien to African countries. Uh, they don't do unilateral sanctions um, within the union. And then although African countries support multilateral sanctions, especially sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council, I think to a very large extent, so support is symbolic, has symbolic value. And the reason why the, uh, it's only symbolic in value is because um, most uh, of the countries in Africa, if not all of them, are dependent countries. They depend, they depend on the international system. They depend on more powerful actors, especially outside of the continent for their economic well-being, for their political survival, and all of that. So it becomes really difficult for them to impose sanctions on non-African states or actors. So to that extent, uh, unilateral sanctions doesn't appear appealing to them. And I also quickly want to uh, point out that we should not forget that uh, in the recent past, uh, most of the proxy wars between the West and East were fought uh, in many of these African countries. And uh, these African countries don't want to is a, a continuation of that scenario. Uh, perhaps that's the reason why we see 
uh, their cold approach to the present unilateral sanctions on, on Russia. Um, so we just, just wanted to mention those uh, two points. Thank you. Thank you, John Agbonifo from Ozun State University. It was great to have you here. I will now pass the microphone to Rishika. So um, thank you for inviting me for this workshop. Uh, it is definitely on a very relevant topic. So um, I'm Rishika Chauhan. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at King's College London. So my takeaway uh, from this workshop is probably that work needs to be done on both sides. Uh, now West or the global North or the developed states as we define them, I think it needs to acknowledge its own history of uh, unilateralism, be conscious of uh, how sanctions have unfolded for a lot of countries, how it's hurt them. Um, so which leads me to my next point, which is that you have to study uh, sanctions from the perspective of the sanctionee as well, see yeah. their approaches. Uh, this is very understudied, and exactly. that probably would help us to understand sanctions better, and probably that's the purpose of this workshop as well. Uh, so uh, the sanctionee perspective. Now, uh, for the non-Western part or the global South, um, I mean, I, I'd quote Shakespeare and say, um, a rose uh, called by any other name would still smell as sweet. So sanctions called by any other name would still sting. Uh, I do understand uh, how these inhibitions are shaped uh, in a lot of developing countries where they are using coercive measures like sanctions, but they have these inhibitions to call them sanctions. Um, uh, this leads me to my first point, which is, again, to understand them, uh, why they're not using the word sanction, why are they so defensive when they use them, or uh, why are they, uh, why do they have so much angst against sanctions as an instrument of policy? Uh, I mean, it goes back to their experience as sanctionee. So um, we need many more of these workshops to come up with uh, how exactly sanctions should be understood and are understood in different parts of the world. That's it. Rishika, thank you very much. And now uh, I see Intigam from um, the cloud. Thank you. I'm Intigam Manyadu from Russia, former, former associate professor of Moscow State University and currently an associate research fellow in OSC Academy in Bishkek. I'm glad to have been involved to this workshop. And uh, the biggest takeaway for me from this workshop is that uh, often using uh, same definitions same concepts, similar methods and approaches. We understand and we look at sanctions in different ways. Uh, so there are very different visions uh, of sanctions as a policymaking instrument uh, on the international level. And uh, the theoretical issues in the study of sanctions strongly depend on such uh, perceptions and understandings to my mind. In this sense, our workshop today uh, is a unique uh, attempt uh, to mutually enrich uh, our perspectives uh, on sanctions. And uh, a few more words uh, about uh, another consideration uh, which relates to the uh, <clears throat> world order issue, uh, to the problem of trust in uh, international relations and world politics that uh, we also touched during our discussions and during uh, very interesting presentations of our participants. Uh, in that case, uh, I mean, we have, to, uh, we have to concentrate our attention to the equal and to the consistent implementation of sanctions. Uh, we need to focus on the equal uh, space uh, for different uh, conflicts to be included uh, in uh, international agenda. Uh, if sanctions are imposed in one case and are not in another case, or when one conflict uh, gains much more attention than a similar uh, 
uh, one, there will be uh, no trust uh, either to the West or to the United Nations or to the just sanctioning mechanisms uh, or to uh, universal values, principles of international law, and so on and so on. It, uh, everything uh, will seem as a kind of political conjuncture for uh, uh, broad social perceptions at least. Thank you. Intigam, thank you very much again for these very uh, important uh, final remarks. Um, I also want to contribute to the party uh, by saying a couple of words for uh, something that has been, I think, for me very enriching um, and trying to bring the perspective of the non-West or the non-Western perspective on sanctions was one of the provocative angles or provocative devices trying to make sure that we actually try not to forget the others. Now, of course, uh, this carries risks. When uh, with Roberto we were thinking about what do we do at the end of the year? And this was a very interesting year for sanctions. So we had, we had a, a lot of a lot of events uh, on sanctions, but you know, we were always forgetting the other side. As you know, we were already said, what are the others thinking? So the first element was the targets. Where are the targets? What do they think? Because very often it's easy for us to say, well, we sanction you because of X, Y, and Z. But the sanctioned one needed to be brought in. Um, so we thought about organizing this event uh, to bring a lot of you know, different voices uh, um, around the table and to talk about what do, how do we make sense of this. So we started with the West, no Western, and Global IR. And I have three, four points that I wanted to, to, to uh, share. The, and of course, I'm not saying much smarter things that has been, have been said already. I'm trying to repackage what the, <laughs> the great contributors have uh, given us in these uh, two days and in this um, uh, final uh, session. So the first is the, common, the, the lack of common language, because we don't have the, the vocabulary to call the same practice. And this is where I think Global IR can really help us to make sure that we, we take away the normative understanding of a concept, sanctions, because we end up talking about what, you know, these, and, and, and this, this becomes a divisive term when the practice is not divisive. So I, you know, I think that the Global IR can really uh, help us in, in addressing this. Very important issue that Intingham said on the lack of trust in international institutions. And this is something important that we need to work on. And, but I think that we can work on that even without Global IR, but that's another story. Um, but what I think that the Global IR can help is, or the, you know, try to bring the non-Western perspective, is also, and that's point two, the lack of a common ethos. Uh, mm -hmm. So when do we when do we act together? Uh, what are the things that we need to say? Listen, no matter where you are, west, non west, up or down, north or south, there are certain things that we say that's not that cannot happen. Um, so there is something that we that we can we can try to to, to come together and and, and stigmatize certain uh, behaviors, certain practices, certain events but then we'll be able to bring a lot of actors uh, around the table. Um, for a third point, um, and I think that this is uh, severely understudied, I mean, Tom and a few others <laughs> knows uh, how important I think is the signaling dimension. And then we talked about signals and costly signals. And, and so in the same final session, some of you said, uh, these are costly signals. While others, they said, why would we do it? So some uh, countries say, why do we do it? Because it doesn't make much of a difference. So is the, how do we make sense of cost? <laughs> mm -hmm. Because there is an economic cost, but there is also a normative cost. And then there is a, 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 an, an identity cost. And all these different understanding of how we make sense of cost might bring together West and non-West. Because in the West, we have maybe, uh, again, I'm brutalizing West and non-West because I agree with all of your concerns <laughs> okay. uh, about the terminology. <clears throat> but if we want to try to use this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an instrument for us to be more self-aware, as Rishika was telling us, we very much tend to talk of, of cost in terms of economic costs. Mm -hmm. But there are costs that go beyond uh, the economy or the material understanding. And maybe that's what the non-Western approaches can help us as well, or the global AR. There are certain costs that go beyond the GDP and trade and these type of things. Maybe we should also learn to account for that. Final point is um, we are talking about global politics. We're talking about actors and states and countries, but 
whose voices are we, are we listening to? Who are we uh, describing when we talk about the practices? Uh, what is Russia? Uh, is, it, is it an elite? Is it a party? Is it the Russians? Is it everyone in Russia? What about the different practices? There is a lot of discussion going on, acts of resistance, the everyday. So trying to, trying to a little bit going beyond this very you know, uh, strong based state ontology that we, again, use a lot in Western traditions, maybe we can go beyond and see that there is something else that we are un unable to capture unless we precisely rely on global IR as an instrument or, or as, a, as a field where we can all talk, space. Uh, as a space yeah. where we can all talk and interact with each other. Um, and I think that this was, at least for me, a, a very interesting uh, workshop, as I, as I said. Um, it was a long year for me. I think anybody works, working on sanctions was a very <laughs> intense year. Um, we have done a lot of things, but I have, to, I have to confess that this was truly the most unique right. and yep. enriching event that I had in 2022. Uh, so I would like, again, to extend my, my great uh, thank to you, uh, all of you, for uh, participating, for uh, uh, Tom's, uh, for, for, for closing and, and bringing all of us together in a way that only uh, Tom can do. Uh, thank you, Roberto, uh, again, for helping. Um, and for not only for helping, helping is a, <laughs> is a slight understatement. <laughs> uh, so for doing everything and for putting this together, thanks to the University of Trento. And again, thank uh, the global IR section, <laughs> the global IR section of the ISA for also making this uh, an institutionalized moment that we can all uh, you know, report to the sanctions uh, debate and hopefully to the, R to the IR debate. Having said that, thank you all of you. Thanks and uh, well, good luck and happy 2023 as well, given thank the you. moment of the year. Thank you. 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 Thank you.